Hey everybody, welcome back once again to Realms Remembered, episode 16, still no theme music. Seriously, nobody out there, a little theme music? Come on, something? Realms Remembered, huzzah! That's about the best I can do, sorry. Okay, so let's start in 1367, Year of the Shield. I never say the years because, well, I don't really care, but um, felt like saying it that time. I don't know why. So, uh, the Shadow Stone is what I'm going to talk about here, and the thing is that actually uh, the Shadow Stone takes place over a course of maybe 25 or so years, uh, something like that. Actually, probably less than that, because it follows a kid from, I don't know, maybe 12 or so to uh, 22, 25, it gets a little unclear in here, but uh, 1367 is at least a kind of specific point in here where the main character, Eren, uh, becomes the Stormwalker on the Merchwood, which is about uh, about the beginning of Act 3. Yeah, let's talk about the Shadow Stone. It's a bit of a unique story for the realms, simply for the fact that it takes place over such a long period of time. Uh, Whisper of Waves is, I think, the only other one that we've come across that uh, takes place over that long of a period of time. Not a bad book, but I would say, obviously, one of Richard Baker's earlier efforts, efforts for sure. A very frustrating book in a lot of ways. We have a main character who's kind of kicked down on society and thrown into this other world of being a mage. And he always wants to go the faster way, the easier way. He's very, very Luke Skywalker. And in the sense that Luke Skywalker always feels like a hero, Eren, our main character, always feels like he's headed down the dark path, which I thought was interesting and I wanted to see this. I thought, oh, okay, we're going to take the kind of typical hero's journey, but do it for the bad guy, uh, much like Wanted. This seemed a, a unique and intriguing way to approach um, a story in the realms. This could be like red magic or whatever, but done really, really well, essentially. But then, somewhere in the story, for no apparent reason, he becomes good. And and it, it, it that didn't make any sense to me. Like, the entire kind of plot is basically uh, he... Uh, uh, assaults this nobleman's kid because the nobleman's kid like messes with him and and he goes and studies with a wizard for a while and he learns about magic and we have these really long drawn out this is how magic works sort of explanations which I don't really care about I mean like even when I'm running a game basically if a wizard casts a spell if one of my NPC wizards casts a spell I just wiggle my fingers and go and that's how the spell happens because I don't give a shit about you know, the, the, the weave and the wibbly-wobbly and the thingy-wiggy and the... I, they wave their hands, say a little something, and a spell happens. That's all I need to know. That's all I care about. If you really want, uh, like, delving into where magic comes from and how elves and humans see magic differently and approach it, and this is certainly the book for you. It seems like something that should be in a rules book, like a system book for the realms, but I don't know if it is because... I wouldn't buy it if it was out there, so who knows? But yeah, if you're into that sort of stuff, this book has that like crazy, uh, which made the uh, first third or so of it go really fast for me, because I just skipped all that, because I don't give a damn. So he studies with this wizard, and uh, uh, the thing is, the wizard is like, you want to learn too fast, you're being too much of a bastard, and like, if you do this one thing, then I can't help you anymore. Of course he does the one thing, and again, I'm like, this is cool, he's turning out to be a bad guy. I really want to see where this goes. So the wizard's like, well, I can't help you anymore. You you are too fast. You just want to explore the dark side, and I have no truck with that. So goodbye, but I'll write you a letter of recommendation to this wizard school. Which is, honestly, all things considered, pretty darn nice of him. So Aaron goes and enrolls in the wizard school, and then we interact too, which is creepy because it turns into Harry Potter for about 50, 70 pages. I kid you not, like, he becomes involved in a school where he's entered in uh, uh, one house, there are all these rival houses, and there's a uh, bully kid who's noble-born and doesn't think that the peasants or mudblood should be, I mean, they don't call them mudbloods, but they might as well, the mudblood should be there, and he gets into fights with him, he has this uh, really smart female who's helping him out, uh, he has better talent, She's smarter. There's no real Ron character, but it, it matches up pretty well, and it's kind of eerie at places. I, I'm not saying that Rowling like ripped this off or stole it or anything. God no, but it's it's eerie the similarities. I mean, they're both based on 
people going to private schools essentially so it's not it's not like it's anything crazy but it's just amu amusing because <laughs> amusing because it, it matches up so closely he begins messing around with one of the wizards who is dabbling in shadow magic and we get our first real taste of shadow magic i think uh at this point in the um, major realms books of course uh the return of the arch wizards anthology delves into this um puts little bits and pieces through the world where we see shadow magic being messed with, but we've never really seen it on screen until now, I don't think. No sort of netheries shadow magic that I can think of. I don't know, maybe I'm totally forgetting something. It could be something I even talked about and I'm totally forgetting about it at this point. I guess my memory's probably not good enough to really try to attempt this, uh, this experiment, but somebody let me know if I'm wrong, I think this is the first really big push of Shadow Magic we've had, which I'm excited about because we're getting really, really close to third edition now, and the return of Shadow Magic is a big, big part, at least, of the return of the Archwizards trilogy. I don't know if that really follows into third edition stuff or not, but at least the return of the Archwizards trilogy, it plays a big role. So that's exciting, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, after that, uh, let's see, my memory is failing me here. Part of what happens, oh, he... he so there's this big sort of ritual for all the people who follow the ways of shadow magic to touch this stone and become like the dark servants of this stone and he refuses to and uh he's on the pl he's in the plane of shadow which i was like oh man wouldn't it be awesome if like at one point he looked up in the air and he happens to see a floating city and he's like i wonder what the hell that is but sadly no they weren't thinking that far in, in advance and it probably doesn't work with the uh, geography anyway but it would have been cool wouldn't it he refuses to touch the stone, which seems completely and ridiculously out of character, because the entire time he's just wanted more power, and the stone is offering more power. And it's, you know, it's the whole Dark Jedi thing. It's the whole, uh, uh, you get stronger, faster, but there's a price. And all of a sudden, randomly out of the blue, he's like, well, but wait, that's bad! Uh, so he opens up, like, a dimensional door, throws himself hundreds of miles from home, and he's like, man, screw all this, I'm just gonna go back home. So he does, and he hangs out there, and he, like, builds houses and like it just it just kind of suddenly comes to a grinding halt and then uh his uh his elf wizard buddy who he used to know uh is there and he's like uh, you know i'm getting a little tired of this and even though i've only seen you do like bad things and follow the dark path um why don't you become the uh the protector of these woods so then he becomes the protector of the woods and it's like it, it's this really long complex involved book which is cool except for the fact that his character just seems to kind of change on a whim at that one point in the novel, and after that, he's totally a good guy. Albeit a good guy who has, uh, who, who doesn't do things perfectly right off the bat, but still, you could have gotten away with that with a character who was much more of a uh, upstanding, I don't know, Kellum Vore, Lion's Bane sort of character from the beginning, because he has to figure out how to look over the woods and Oh, find ways to solve problems without killing people or threatening people, even though he has that power. Anyway, things start getting bad throughout the entire nation. Uh, where are they? Ilmater, I think? I, I don't even know. It's somewhere, like, kind of east of where we usually are, I think. Plus, blah, 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 blah. Lots of other reasons. In any case, uh, it winds up with him having to go back against the guy. There's this unrequited love thing in there, uh, love story in there, and I think it, I, I think in the end, like, randomly this chick who hasn't liked him through the entire series, or suddenly likes him for no reason, like, there are a lot of things toward the end that just seem to happen for no reason, except, well, what the hell, like, Baker was like, eh, it'd be kind of unexpected if this happened, so I'll just throw that in, even though there's no motivation or build-up to it. So very, very frustrating book for all those things because I thought it would be interesting to see that sort of wanted style story, which if you've only seen the movie Wanted, you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Read the comic book. Mark Miller has said it's supposed to be, the idea behind it is this is it's the origin of a supervillain told in the style of an origin of a uh, superhero. So it's a very frustrating book in the sense that I wanted to see that story. I wanted to see that wanted Dr. Horrible style story of how somebody go down that path. And it doesn't end up being that. And it's also frustrating because the sort of bad guys' plans in this seem like so well thought out and so large and epic and blah, 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 that them defeating it by like, I can't even remember, it's something ridiculous. Like they like break the uh, stand that the Shadow Stone sits on so it falls <laughs> and destroys itself or something like that. It just felt 
like a cheat, like a huge cheat. And I was like, man, this story should have been the story that led into Return of the Arch Wizards. It would lead in perfectly, I think. And the plans here to essentially return shadow magic to the world and make the uh, uh, the Shadow Var the rulers once again would have dovetailed perfectly in with uh, Return of the Arch Wizards. And I think actually in my own head, you know how you sometimes rewrite continuity, tweak things a little bit to make things flow better for you? I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to tweak that so that Aaron and his friends died horribly. The Shadowstone prevailed, except the thing that it did was allow Shade's return and uh, set up the Return of the Arch Wizards trilogy because really Aaron could die and I could care less. So why not, right? A few little things here and there that are nice twists, but like for instance, Aaron now is set up as, you know, Mr. Good. He's a good, good guy, and he stands for good and blah, 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 blah. But there's this one point where he just hesitates for no real reason, and, like, his best friend's dad gets killed. And she's like, what the hell were you doing? You're just standing over there. And he's like, oh, um, I couldn't remember my motivation for a minute. I mean, it just seems really random. That's, again, frustrating, because moments like that happen, and you're not sure why. A few quotes. This one's just ridiculously fun. Most of the writing's okay, though I will say Baker is not great at dialogue. I don't need great dialogue, though. Uh, Salvatore's not amazing at dialogue either, but he's better than he gives himself credit for, I think, which is why in a lot of his earlier stuff he keeps explaining dialogue, even though it doesn't need it. So just as an example of how Baker is not great with dialogue, but I'm okay with that as long as the story's interesting, and I kept expecting this to go somewhere better. And it's well written besides the dialogue, so I don't feel this fell under the like, you know, it's bad, we're gonna skip it sort of mentality. And here's an example. You'll rue the day you ever crossed my path, he crowed. <laughs> uh, it's just, yeah, anyway. Then the only other thing that I highlighted was a couple of places where he keeps saying, and then. He uses the phrase, and then, dozens of times, and it's so frustrating. I'm almost certain I've used it at least once in this, but when you're speaking, especially extemporaneously, I can forgive little things like, and then. When you're writing, it is unforgivable. To do it multiple times is crazy making. So hopefully this wasn't edited by Philip Athens because I heart Philip Athens and I want to believe great things of him. Which is amusing considering one of the books we're leading up to here pretty soon. But that will have to wait. Also in 1367, Murder in Cormier. I have to say, I think this is the best written book that I've read so far. Even the stuff that I've enjoyed the most can't even come close to comparing to this. I believe this is Chet Williamson, which maybe explains it, because he's kind of more of a uh, mainstream author who dabbled in the realms a little bit, it seems. But yeah, this one is just really, really well written. I, uh, I highlighted a few bits, and I don't know what I was thinking here. Here are a few bits that I highlighted to showcase, like, this first one is, like, the only example of bad writing I found in the entire thing, hence why I highlighted it, which I feel kind of crappy about, because I'm like, hey, let me highlight the one bad thing this dude did, even though I really, really like it, but whatever. He rubbed Grimalkin's ears until the cat purred. I was starting to be able to tell the cats apart now. Obviously, the fact that he said Grimalkin in the sentence before clued me in as a reader that he was beginning to be able to tell the cats apart now. But that's really the only sort of little unnecessary overwritten bit like that that appears in the entire thing that I noticed. A couple of other little fun moments. To the purpose of adventuring, that's what I do. You're a soldier, you soldier. I'm an adventurous. I adventure. Wee. <laughs> that just sums up the character right there. Short declarative sentences. That little wee at the end for no reason. I mean, I think you can get a pretty good handle on what that character is like just from reading that sentence, knowing nothing else about her, right? Then this bit, which comes out of nowhere but is beautiful. Animals forget past fears and hurts all too readily. Perhaps that is why they are able to live with our cruelty. I mean, that's just gorgeous, right? So this is a book that is engaging and interesting, and I totally thought I would hate it. There are these murder in books uh, set in the Warhammer universe by David Bishop that I gave a try to and just found exceedingly dull. Actually, I don't even know if I've ever tried them. They just look dull. They just look like, oh, a murder mystery. Who cares? I mean, it's it's in a magical realm. Like, a murder mystery could be 
really, you know, you, you, you could you could do the whole, because the whole Sherlock Holmes thing is, like, once you take out the uh, impossible, you, it leaves only the implausible, or, or I guess the plausible, but you have to accept the implausible, even if it seems a little crazy, because obviously you can't do the impossible. But in a magical world, you can kind of think of anything in a whodunit, right? But I think he plays pretty fair uh, with the mystery, and the other thing is you don't really give a damn about the mystery, because the writing is just so good, and the characters pop off the page. What's amazing to me is, I'm not a huge murder mystery fan, and I especially hate Sherlock Holmes, though I just quoted Doyle, but this is completely and totally a Sherlock Holmes riff. Uh, what do they call him in here? Fosric Cambridge or something like that? And there are these stories written about him, and he's obviously meant to be a Sherlock Holmes character, and the narrator of this series is heavily influenced by him and really, really likes him. And he uh, starts working for this guy, who ends up being extremely like that character, but he poo-poos the adventure, so I totally thought it would be revealed at some point that he, in fact, was the person they were based off of, but that never happened. I don't know if that was something that was in there and they decided to cut for whatever reason, if that's something that's brought up in a sequel, but I don't think the sequels have the same characters. I don't know. Really don't have much to say about this, except for the fact that it was surprisingly good, and I really, really liked the characters. Have you ever noticed how it's sometimes much easier to write or speak a bad review than it is a good review? This one's good. <laughs> Go read it. It's about all I can say about it. And I apologize because I feel like I should be saying more, but it just pops off the page and the writing is, is, is fresh and alive and makes you want to keep reading. When I was doing this, I usually read uh, two or three books at a time and I pop back between each every few chapters. And I kept wanting to pop back to this one. In that same year, we have the sequel, Murder in Halrua, which sucks. It's trying to be way too clever by far. It fails. It fails really, really miserably. And it reads as if it's written by someone who doesn't know how to do humor and also thought that the first book was meant to be humor. It's not a comedy. It's just written with a light style. There's a huge difference. So skip it. Once Around the Realms is also very, very skippable. The entire kind of point of it is it's Volo and his adventures, and Volo wrote all those guides, those rules guides. And it's meant to be this very kind of like wacky, oh, Volo is, I don't know, kind of cool, and then he has this dumb sidekick, and they meet every character ever. Who cares? Skip it. I, I Maybe it would work as some sort of intro to the realms, but I don't need that, and it feels... It, 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 I mean, even before I got to him meeting any characters, it felt forced, and I just don't care. It's just badly written. Skip that as well. Whew. We are finally through 1367. 1368 is going to be an even bigger year. Way more books happening there. Let's just cover the first book out of that year, because we're skipping it. The Mage and the Iron Mask, which is a sequel to Once Around the Realms, again starring Volo and his sidekick, I don't know, Pipsqueak or something. And just to give you an example of how goddamn clever it thinks it is, here's, an, here's a line from it. And Flan already has a resident thespian, Ward T. James. Ward T. James, Volo repeated inquisitively. And then it goes on to say that Ward T. James is from uh, SSI and it stands for like standard, I don't know, SSI. So they make it some sort of like acting company. Oh, and he's doing the Pool series, which is a series of adventures all about things that happen in the realms, but set in pools of mud. Well, SSI is the company that does the computer games based on Forgotten Realms uh, adventures. James Ward of TSR did the uh, was involved with the Pool series there. Uh, he's like their liaison or writer or whatever. So it's like, oh, ha, 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 look at how in-jokey and witty we are. I'm sorry, I don't want my realms to be meta joke I I I just don't... I, if it's done really subtly and cleverly, maybe. Maybe I'll let it pass. I mean, hell, Salvatore is so goofy and jokey so much of the time that I'm guessing he's done it, and I probably just haven't noticed it because I kind of write that stuff out in my head. So we're saying your own continuity. But this was just trying too hard, and I did not care for it, did not like it. So we are skipping that. I'm gonna come back with books from 16 or 1368 that I did read. So that'll be exciting. Leave that for next time. For now, I have talked a very long time, and I did not mean to, but Shadowstone was incredibly complex plot-wise. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.